The biggest problem in the world today is not war. It is not disease, cancer, AIDS, and so on. It is not children starving in Africa or in some other parts of the world. It is not poverty, and it is not crime. The biggest problem in the world today is that people do not know who they are, and consequently, they got their priorities all mixed up. You ask the average person, who are you? And they will look in the mirror and they will say, this is me. And they are wrong. When you look in the mirror, you do not see your self, quote unquote, you see your body. And your body is simply a garment that you are wearing for 50 or 100 years. Then you shed it. You know, it's a matter of common sense. There is a difference between a living body and a dead body. The living body is full of vitality and spark, and when it dies, the spark is gone and becomes stiff, just like a piece of wood. And uh, we know that something is gone, the person is gone. So we can easily agree that a person consists of a body and a soul, and the soul is the real person. And uh, this is where the people fail to recognize who they are. If they knew that the body is not them, they will rearrange their priorities and they will pay more attention to themselves, their selves, not their bodies. A person goes to school for many, many years, works hard, takes examinations, and even after school he gets a job to make some money and so on, all this to care for the body, a vanishing entity that will become stiff, dead, someday. And when that day comes, almost everyone will look at that uh, lifeless body and say, for this thing, I went to school, I worked hard, I took examinations, I uh, earned a lot of money, and I spent it all to care for this thing, this vanishing, stiff, part of me. What did I do for myself? There is something that we must do. And uh, this is what life is all about. We have to rearrange our priorities and, and this cannot result without knowing that I am a body and a soul. And I must put the body in the service of the soul. To drive the point home, just take an average person and ask him or her, uh, what did you feed yourself today? What did you feed your soul today? Let's start with the question, what did you feed your body today? And they will tell you, I gave my body breakfast, lunch, dinner, numerous snacks, but they gave nothing to the real person, to themselves. What did they feed themselves? We nourish the babies. <clears throat> when we are born, we give the baby milk and so on, and then the baby grows, becomes a child, and we give him uh, potatoes and meat and rice, and the body grows to five or six feet. But what did we do for the real person? This is the major question that we're addressing right now. This is what life is all about. People are giving attention to the vanishing entity and totally ignoring the real person. 
There is such a thing as food for the soul, nourishment for the real person. And now the new thing that I have for you is tangible evidence that uh, there is food and nutrition for the real person. And the strange thing that is not known yet, is not commonly known anyway, is that just as the body grows, the real person or the soul grows in leaps and bounds. Maybe the body goes to five or six feet, but the soul or the real person grows to immense sizes. I don't want to confuse you right now, but uh, the size of the soul can be as big as uh, the city of Tucson. I'm not exaggerating. We now have tangible evidence that the soul can grow from a very small size, like a cat, to a huge size. And this makes it even more important to nourish and feed the real person. Now, what is the food for the soul? This tangible evidence that uh, we just obtained tells us uh, the evidence, by the way, comes from the Creator, from God Himself. And He tells us that we must make contact with God every day to cause this nutrition and nourishment of the soul. Because the soul is literally a piece of God. And God says, if you have anything to do with me, with God, your soul will, will, will grow. If you remember, in the Bible, at the beginning, God said He breathed into Adam the breath of life. So the soul is a part of God's breath. And if we have anything to do with God, we grow. However, there is a specific set of nutrition that we can offer to ourselves. Another question that illustrates this biggest problem in the world, namely that the people do not know who they are, is that uh, you ask the average person, how old are you? And he or she will give you a number somewhere between 15 and 85 years old. Wrong, again. Any person, the real person, is a few billion years old. And this is the new information that we obtained from this new tangible evidence. You can easily see the problem if we illustrate a little bit how the human being consists of two entities. One entity is the body. Let, let us represent it by this dot right here. And the eternal person and this is an infinite entity. It will never die. It just goes on forever and ever. So here we have a body that lasts a period of time somewhere between 50 and 100 years. We know that we all exist. We are all under death sentence. And this period, when divide any number, when you divide any number by infinity, it equals zero. If you live 1,000 years, you divide this by infinity, and it equals zero. This is just plain mathematics. So the body that is going to live for a zero, for all practical purposes, zero period of time, is taking all our attention. We spend a 24 hours a day taking care of this insignificant entity, the vanishing entity. And the question is, how much are we doing for this eternal entity, the real me? What am I doing for it? Cool. Now that we agree that we must rearrange our priorities and give more attention to the real person, the soul, instead of wasting all our life taking care of the vanishing entity, now what specifically are we supposed to do? You know, there are so many people who are talking in vague terms about capturing the heavenly light and dissolving it into your whole uh, being and all this that doesn't mean a thing, you know, all these things. It is much more practical than that. It is much more specific than that. And God has been sending to us the exact methodology of developing our person, our real self, since Adam, since the first human being. 
It came down to us in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms of David, in the Gospel of Jesus, in the Quran, and now we have specific methods of developing the person, the soul, and uh, exactly what to do and when, and the most efficient ways and the least efficient ways. We now possess this valuable information. And we're told that you must make contact with God, your Creator, five times a day. This contact, you can think of uh, ropes coming down from the Creator and keeping us out of this sizzling pan called the world. At the same time, we develop and we nourish our self, the real self, the soul, by making these contacts five times a day. We are given exactly the combination, actually it's a numerical secret combination that anyone can obtain. And through this secret mathematical combination, you can make contact with God and nourish and develop your real self. Five times a day, you are given the combination, you are given the method, how to do it, when to do it. And uh, this is the way to provide for yourself. Everyone takes breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and so on, and uh, dresses nicely, and uh, buys a nice home, and has a beautiful spouse or a handsome spouse, as the case may be. And all this to take care of the vanishing entity, the body. The big question is, what are you doing for you, the real person? And you can agree with me now that this is the biggest problem in the world, not knowing who we are. You notice I mentioned making contact with God. And this is, I'm talking about a specific methodology. I'm not talking about uh, prayer. Prayer is fine, and it will contribute to the growth and nourishment of the person's soul, the real person. You know, millions of children grow up, we grow up uh, knowing that uh, we must say grace before we eat, uh, say a short prayer, uh, God is good, God is great, please uh, thank you for our food, and all that. Uh, uh, millions of people uh, pray, uh, I mean, they utter supplications, ask God for favors, and uh, all this is fine, God loves that, but I'm talking about a practical, uh, a real meal for the real person. Uh, we have this physical evidence telling us exactly what to say, what sounds to utter. It is like the combination of a safe. You have uh, this combination, uh, a knob on a safe or, or where there's a treasure, and you have to turn it this way a certain number of times, and then this way to another number, and so on, and then you open the safe, and you have the treasure. It is very similar to that. A numerical combination, a numer uh, combination of sounds that you must utter, a combination of movements that you must do, and uh, this is common to all religions. It came to us, like I said, in the older scriptures and the latest scriptures and in this new discovery of a tangible uh, mathematically coded method. And uh, if you contact me at the telephone number shown at the end of this program, I can discuss this specific method with you. And the contact with God is not the only way to develop the soul. There are, there are many other methods but uh, the daily contact with God is the most efficient. This is the steak of the soul food. But uh, for example, uh, there is a method uh, of fasting where you dictate on the body exactly when the body is going to eat or drink. And this, uh, there's even a specific time of the year for that. So God told us exactly what to do to nourish our soul. And if this becomes known to you or to any other person, uh, you can ask them, what did you do for your self today? And they will not say zero or nothing, like most people would say now. The person would answer, I gave my body breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I gave myself five good meals by contact, uh, contacting my Creator five times today there will be a big difference. There will be the proper arrangement of priorities. Right now, the priorities are all reversed. People are spending 
99% uh, of their time caring for the vanishing entity and totally unaware, totally neglecting the real self, the real person. And it's a big shame because when the time comes and we shed the body, we will really regret that we didn't give, give uh, the real person, the soul, the proper attention. You know, it is very well and finally established now that money, fame, beauty, and so on do not bring happiness. There is always something missing. Did you see the Barbara Hutton story that was shown on TV the other day? I was listening to a special, Barbara Walters special. She was interviewing Eddie Murphy. Here is a movie star who's got everything. He has uh, two uh, Rolls Royces, a Mercedes, a Corvette. He's got a palatial estate in New Jersey, his family. Yet he told Barbara Walters there is something missing. We have to develop the real self in order to be happy. If you have a body that has everything, money, fame, everything it wants, everything the body wants, but the soul is not nourished, happiness will be missing. And this, now you can appreciate that this is the biggest problem in the world. And uh, I know what you're thinking. Uh, you're probably saying, what is the catch? What, how much do I have to pay for this? Ironically, this very precious knowledge is free. It is just yours for the asking. And uh, like I said, it is uh, not, there is no mincing of words. There is uh, no vague ideas. This is, I'm talking about specifics. Happiness has been the most elusive goal for everybody. And uh, now we know that material success, money, fame, and all this does not bring happiness. Now we have a concrete, tangible uh, method by where we know, actually the secret of happiness, this most elusive of our goals, has been unveiled. And you ask all the philosophers and the uh, people who uh, have a lot of experience in life, and they will tell you readily that material success does not bring happiness. Money, fame, success, all this does not bring happiness. And I mentioned to you uh, Eddie Murphy as an example in his interview with uh, Barbara Walters. But now we have a concrete method with a track record that tells us that this most elusive of our goals, happiness, is actually attainable. And the secret is in developing and nourishing the real person. The people are unaware, they're going about their life totally unaware, totally neglecting the real self. And if they only develop and nourish the real person and put their priorities in perspective, happiness will be readily theirs. I'm not talking about something uh, over there in heaven somewhere uh, where you have to die first, stay in the grave millions of years, and then uh, get resurrected in order to be in paradise and, uh, and all that. I'm talking about happiness, victory, success, uh, the real thing here in this world. It's just like, like I mentioned earlier, like the combination. You turn that combination uh, to the right, left, and so on in the correct numbers, and you open it and you have the treasure. Now, you do the specific procedure just like a cookbook recipe. It's just as simple as that. I'm not exaggerating. God told us exactly how to do it, what to do, and what to say. And the combination is very specific. You do it and you get the results. As you see, it's been all common sense. And this is why you ought to believe me. Why should you believe me, by the way? Let me ask that question. Why should you believe me? You should believe me because when you discuss this matter with me, if we meet in person, I'll show you tangible evidence, and you will see that we have a mathematically coded message from God. You will see the physical evidence. If you don't see it, just leave. I mean, you don't have to take it. You look at the evidence, you see it is tangible, concrete, and you see the results, and uh, you visualize the whole thing. I mean, it, it, is, it will be in front of you. 
There is no imagination or speculation or conjecture. This is the real thing. And from the beginning of this program to the end, it is all common sense, isn't it? Now, who would be the most authoritative source to give you uh, this kind of information? The creator, the one who created your soul, the one who breathed into Adam from his breath. Your soul is a piece of God, and uh, the source of all this information is God. And you will see it supported by physical evidence. This is a new stage in human history, and you can be one of the pioneers to discover this. The discovery, by the way, uh, is, is very recent, and uh, maybe 50 years from now everybody will know about it. But right now, only select few. The elite of the elite knows it. And you can be one of those. Uh, God willing, it will be uh, known in a shorter time than 50 years. But you can grasp this opportunity now. You live in this world only one life, and then we go on to the, we move on to a new stage, the eternal real life, where everyone is, is assigned a rank and a position depending on how much you nourished your real self. Uh, can you hire uh, a child as a pilot or an engineer? You can't. Therefore, you have to develop the real person and grow and nourish in order to be strong enough for the eternal real life that will come after this world. And then you'll be assigned a prominent rank and like I said, you don't have to wait for that. Happiness, real happiness, and the, the consequences of nourishing your soul begin right here. God's promises have to be a fact. And God says he promises those among you who believe and lead a righteous life that they will be sovereigns on earth, kings and queens on earth. And when God says that he promises, it is done. What I told you is a very condensed summary of this major historical event. Uh, n needless to say, there is a lot of detail that uh, anyone can come and see me and, uh, and talk about it and discuss it. They can demand the proof. Where is the physical evidence, the concrete, tangible evidence you're talking about? They can come and ask me that, and I will show it to them, and then they can make the decision themselves. They have got nothing to lose. And this is all free. I'll never ask him for a penny. So uh, they can come and see me at, uh, in Tucson at 739 East 6th Street. Or better yet, call and make an appointment, and uh, I will sit with them and show them the proof. Uh, the telephone number uh, should be shown at the end of this program. It is 791-3989. And uh, it could be the most important step uh, they have made in their life. And it results from the realization that we are not just walking zombies, we're not just bodies walking around uh, with nothing in them. <laughs>
الحمد لله. We praise God. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. And we bear witness that there is no God except the one God. It is very important for any person to know who God is, to really appreciate why millions of people fall into idol worship. Why do they leave God and idolize Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or St. Francis or St. Jude or some helpless creature? And uh, the main reason is that the people do not know who God is. They do not appreciate the greatness of God. So my purpose in this sermon is to share with you some idea about the greatness of God. And to appreciate the greatness of God, we, we have to think of this universe that we are living in. Our planet Earth is part of the solar system, as you all know. And by the way, I'm going to talk to you strictly about scientific facts, established scientific facts. This Earth is part of the solar system. It is the only planet in the solar system that has life. We went to the moon and we didn't see a single tree there or a mouse, nothing. We sent cameras to Mars and we didn't see a creature there unless those rocks are creatures as we saw in one of the cartoons. There is no life in the solar system except here on the planet Earth. Our sun, the center of this solar system, is 93 million miles away. Now, I want you to watch these distances. 93 million miles away from us, the sun. And the light comes to us from the sun in four minutes. So remember this relationship. The light travels from the sun to the earth 93 million miles in four minutes. The solar system itself spans a distance of 2 billion to 4 billion miles. This is our solar system. So when you go to the edge of our solar system, if you travel 2 billion with a B, 2 billion miles away, how big is the planet Earth from that point? It will seem small. Okay, let us now go a little further. Let us talk about the galaxy, our galaxy. As you know, it is called the Milky Way galaxy. And the solar system is one, the sun of the solar system is one of one billion suns or stars in our Milky Way galaxy. It will take four minutes for the light to travel from the sun to the planet Earth. 93 million miles. You know how long it will take to cross the Milky Way galaxy? If you travel at the speed of light, you will cross the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, in 100,000 years. Not four minutes, or 10 minutes, or one hour, or 10 hours, or 10 days, or 10 years. It will take you 100,000 years to travel across the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. Now, so if you go to the border, the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, and try to find the planet Earth, where is it? It's minute, isn't it? Just a tiny moat. You know, when you look in the sunlight and see these little things flying, those are called moats. And the Earth is not even that within the Milky Way galaxy. Well, let us travel, let us go on a little further. Let us go to our next door galaxy, our neighbor. You know how far it is, our neighbor galaxy? Two million light years away. So if you're cooking something and you want to borrow some salt or some sugar from your neighbors, don't go to the next door galaxy. It will take you two million years going at the speed of light and two million years coming at the speed of light and your cooking will be all gone. <laughs> so two million light years from our galaxy to the next door galaxy. 
Now, so if you go to the next door galaxy and try to find the planet Earth in the Milky Way, how, what are your chances of seeing the planet Earth using the strongest possible imaginable telescope? Can you find the planet Earth? How about your house or you or any human being like Jesus or Muhammad? Can you see them from that galaxy, our next door galaxy? Shall we move a little further? There are one billion galaxies in our universe. This is one billion with a B. A billion trillion stars in our galaxy. In our universe, excuse me. There are one billion galaxies in our universe. A billion trillion stars in our universe. Our universe now has dis distances of 10, 15, up to 26 billion light years distances within our universe. And you can easily imagine this now. If our next door galaxy, and these are all, I remind you, these are all scientific established scientific facts. 26 billion light years within our universe. You have to agree with me that when you go to the edge of our universe, it is hopeless to try to find the planet Earth. It is such an insignificant speck in God's kingdom. It is an established physical fact that when you go, if you go to the edge of our universe, you cannot possibly see the planet Earth. You cannot possibly see the sun of our solar system, let alone the planet Earth. So that's our universe. Before we leave our universe, that's the next step. I would like to remind you that in fact, I will do a calculation thing with you right now. Let us say the number of stars in our universe is not a billion, trillion. Let us just take a smaller number, quintillion. Quintillion. That's a smaller number of stars in our universe. And let us count from one to quintillion. Taking one second per count. It's like, let us say, we're counting the stars. One, two, three, four, one second per count. So we take one quintillion, divide by 60. You get the number of minutes. It will take you to count from one to quintillion. Then you take this number and divide by 60. Again, you get the number of hours. It will take us to count from one to quintillion. Now you take this last product and divide by 24 and you get the number of days it will take you to count from one to quintillion. These are physical facts, as you see, it's just a simple, dividing by the seconds, the minutes, the hours, and the days. Divide by seven, you get the number of weeks, then you divide by four, you get the number of months, you divide by 12, you get the number of years. It will take you to count, just count, a quintillion stars. You know how long it will take you? How many years? This is a mathematical, physical fact. It will take you 32 billion, with a B, 32 billion years, just to count a quintillion stars in our universe. And God created them. God didn't just count them. God created them. And we are talking only about stars in our universe. We're not talking about the planets that go with those stars. We're not talking about the uncountable decillions of, of heavenly bodies and meteorites that are in our universe. We're talking only about stars. The sun is one of the stars, our sun. By the way, it is one of the dim stars. The bright stars, the definition of a bright star is it must be at least 
one million times as bright as our sun. Look outside and see how bright the sun is. A bright star has to be a million times as bright as this, as our sun. We had a conference here at the University of Arizona that dealt with bright stars only. And the sun was not one of them. Because, by definition, a bright star is a million times as bright as our sun. So it will take you 32 billion years just to count, not to create, just to count a quintillion of the billion trillion stars we have in our universe. That's our universe. Now, prepare for a shock. This universe, our universe, vast as we can imagine, is only one of seven universes. And it is the smallest and the innermost of the seven universes. This is a fact that is in the Quran proven by the Quran's mathematical code. We are all now familiar with the mathematical code of the Quran that proves that every word is from God, that it is not written by a human being, that it is God's, God's message to the world. And these mathematically proven statements say that our universe with its billion trillion stars, a billion galaxies, 26 billion light year distances is the smallest and innermost of seven universes. Can you imagine how big the second universe is if our universe is 26 billion light years across the second universe? Can you imagine how big it is? How about the third universe? The fourth that is around these? You can imagine seven balls inside each other. The fifth universe, I don't think you can imagine the size of the fifth universe. How about the sixth universe and the seventh? I can tell you right now, there is no number in the world that can describe or measure the circumference of the seventh universe. Actually, the first universe. We are the seventh universe, the innermost of the seven universes. There is no number that will describe the circumference of the first universe. Now prepare for another shock. Most of you are familiar with that statement in the Quran, in Surah 39, where God says he is holding the seven universes within the fist of his hand. In Arabic, in the Quran, وَالسَّمَوَاتُ مَطْوِيَّاتٌ بِيَمِينِهِ God is not holding the seven universes like this in two hands. God is holding the seven universes in one hand. And this is allegorical description to give us an idea about the greatness of God and who God is. It's an allegorical idea to make us appreciate the greatness of God and to make us appreciate and realize the blasphemy of saying that such great God has a human son on the tiny, tiny speck called the planet Earth. I mean, how can that be? We are a fortunate generation in that with the established scientific facts, we can appreciate the greatness of God. And God tells us who he is in his message to the world, the Quran. And with the sciences we now accomplished, we appreciate that greatness. And therefore, we can appreciate the grossness, the blasphemy of saying that God had a wife or a mother or a son. We can appreciate, we can realize how blasphemous, how terrible it is to say that God has a partner, another God with him. How can we idolize Muhammad, the tiny human being who existed on a tiny planet called the Earth, in a tiny solar system? What was Muhammad's role in deciding the speed of rotation of the moon, for example? The moon rotates around itself and around the Earth, yet we always see one side of the moon, the same side of the moon, because of the perfect synchronize the movement of the moon around itself and around the earth. We see only one side. 
And if that movement was off by one second, we would see the other side of the moon. This precision in God's creation, what was the role of Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or St. Francis in deciding that speed of rotation of the moon? This elaborate system, everything going in its orbit precisely. We know exactly what time the sun will rise in the year 2025, July 4th, 2025. We know exactly, in Tucson, Arizona, for example, we know exactly when, what time would the sun rise and from what spot. Because the sun follows God's laws, God's creation, and follows the exact orbit. God is holding the seven universes in his hand. That's who God is. has always believed in some kind of a God. This need to believe in a supernatural and omnipotent being led many to search for a God, start wars in the name of a God, even create a God if they had to. Hello, my name is Bill Buck. In this report, we are going to present to you what we call the ultimate miracle. You see, when man chose to believe in gods, most of these gods had one thing in common. It was required that they be feared, worshipped, served, and revered. Numerous religions sprang up to serve these gods. Some of the oldest religions still exist today, namely Buddhism, Hinduism, and Shintoism. Some of these religions believe in many gods. For example, a god of fire, a god of water, a god of love, a god of prosperity, and so on. Then came the monotheistic religions, those that believe in one god, all of which are considered major influences in global history and affairs. These are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and significantly, they share a common belief in one global history and affairs. These are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and significantly, they share a common belief in one supreme God. Perhaps the best way to portray these is to look at Jerusalem, where all three religions mingle. We have a historical account of biblical and other prophets and the miracles that they are credited with having performed. There was Moses, who we are told talked to God and led the Jews out of bondage and brought them the Ten Commandments. He even parted the Red Sea when pursued by Pharaoh and his troops, according to the Bible. There was Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the living God to Christians. Through him, 
Christians entered into a new covenant with their creator. Lastly, there was Muhammad. Muslim history tells us that in Mecca, God revealed to him the Quran, the Muslim holy book, which is recited fervently and followed by one-fifth of the world's population. For many centuries, and in spite of man's experience with religion, there still remain many mysteries. The most baffling and complex mystery of all remains the identity and the concept of this God that man has never seen and yet believes in so religiously. This sea of religious confusion has been swelling all the time. Many religions, all claiming to be right, began to break into sects. During all this time, man was advancing economically, socially, militarily, and intellectually. Man continued to advance technologically at an unprecedented pace. But in terms of religion, he was still in this sea of confusion, often misled by tricksters and deeply disappointed with his unanswered prayers to this unseen God. Disappointment and confusion led many to lose their belief. Agnosticism and atheism have become widespread. Many now openly reject or at least question the existence of this God who has been so popular throughout the ages. The theory of Darwin became the accepted opinion of many scientists and scholars who were able to draw supportable conclusions from the proof and arguments presented. But now most scientific and religious thinkers realize that there are deeper questions. So, where does that leave us? Are there any real solutions to this religious dilemma? On the one hand, man cannot accept the illogical practices that religion dictates to him. Yet, by denying God, man still doesn't find the answers to some of his most burning questions, such as, who am I? Why am I here? Is there a God? What is the purpose of life? Just when man's tolerance to manual labor reached a limit and the Industrial Revolution lay around the corner, now an intellectually enlightening revolution seems to be around the corner. Previous generations were converted to believe in God by means of miracles. However, modern man cannot believe in God because of these. He has watched men walk on the moon. He is presented daily with the latest technological marvel. He has come across too many false claims, fake miracles and fake prophets. He has become very cynical, especially when it comes to ancient myths and beliefs. With some arrogance, he believes that he knows more than his forefathers let alone those ancient reporters of fantastic events. He wonders what they would have thought of some of today's miracles. Today's man needs something substantial. He needs an ultimate miracle. All the miracles that were supposed to have converted man over the ages were limited to a particular geographical location or a time period. By definition, an ultimate miracle would be something that is perpetual, not limited to a certain century or geographical location. It would be for all of the people to see all of the time. It would be something that is physical, touchable, examinable, verifiable, and irrefutable. A few years ago, noted scientist and television personality Carl Sagan, in his best-selling novel, talked about a mathematically coded message from outer space. On page 431, the author states, my fondest hope for this book is that it will be made obsolete by the pace of real scientific discovery. Well, it seems that Carl Sagan's fondest hope has come true. Research over the past few years has uncovered just such a mathematical code in a document that is over 1,400 years old. There are other miraculous aspects to this document. For instance, only in the past 20 years has science been able to witness the development of the fetus in the very early stages. However, 1,400 years ago, the development of the fetus in the first 28 days had already been documented and with such graphic accuracy that it left Dr. Moore, chairman of the anatomy department at the University of Toronto, utterly amazed. For at this stage, the embryo is only about one-tenth of a millimeter long and would appear like a dot to the human eye. To discern its shape would require a powerful microscope. However, microscopes were not developed until the 17th century. And yet, 1400 years ago, we find the following. Thereafter, we created of the drop a thing which clings, a leech-like structure. Dr. Moore confirmed that the embryo does in fact cling to the wall of the uterus. 
Another passage describes the stages of fetus development. God makes you in the wombs of your mothers in stages, one after another, within three veils of darkness. Dr. Moore confirmed the accuracy of this description also. He explained that the three veils could reasonably be interpreted to mean the mother's abdominal wall, the wall of the uterus, and the amniochorionic membrane. It goes on. We've all heard about the Big Bang Theory, but who would expect to find an account about the Big Bang Theory 1,400 years ago? But there it is. Do the disbelievers not realize that the heavens and the earth used to be one entity? Then we parted them. The separation process resulted in the formation of multiple worlds. Mention of these worlds is made several times in the document. Also, it would seem that the modern discovery of bridges of matter, which are present outside organized astronomical systems, is referenced in the verse which reads, God is the one who created the heavens, the earth, and what is between them. Today we will only preserve your body to set you up as a sign for subsequent generations. Indeed, most people are heedless of our signs. Miraculously, it seems that the Egyptians were exclusively gifted with the science of mummification. In 1898, Laure discovered the mummified body of Ramses II at Thebes in the Valley of Kings, where it had lain untouched for 3,000 years. He had it transported to Cairo, where it may be seen to this day. The medical study of the mummy of Merneptah, pharaoh of the Exodus, has yielded further useful information on the possible cause of this pharaoh's death. The lack of signs of deterioration of the body proves that the body did not stay in water for a prolonged period of time. And in the heavens, for many centuries it was believed that the moon had its own light. Science discovered not too long ago that the moon really did not generate its own light, but acted only as a reflector of the sun's rays. God is the one who made the sun luminescent and the moon a light and he designed its phases to provide you with a timing device. God did not create all this in vain. God is the one who created the night, the day, the sun, and the moon. Each one is traveling in an orbit with its own motion. Today, it is known how the celestial organization is balanced by the position of stars in a defined orbit and how the interplay of gravitational forces is related to their mass and speed of movement, each with its own motion. Sir Francis Drake proved the Earth to be round when he sailed around it in 1597. Are you more difficult to create than the heaven that he built? He raised its masses and perfected it. He made its night dark and its morning visible. Thereafter, he made the Earth egg-shaped. That was written almost a thousand years before Columbus. We know now that the Earth's atmosphere acts as a filter to prevent harmful radiations from reaching the surface. Short wavelengths like X-rays and ultraviolet rays are filtered out at high altitudes. Protection from these rays is vital to the existence of life on Earth. And we made the sky a protected ceiling. Then there is the affirmation of the modern idea that the origin of life is aquatic. And we made water a requisite for every living thing. Water is the simplest chemical compound of importance to all living things. Most organisms consist of 50 to 95 percent water. Scientists know that absolutely every living entity known to man requires water for its existence. Many properties of water make it essential to life's processes. Its ability to dissolve a great variety of substances is vital because most chemical reactions within organisms can occur only in a water solution. Take the field honeybee, busy bringing in nectar from flowers. On entering the hive with a full honey sac, which is an enlargement of the esophagus, the field bee regurgitates the contents into the mouth of young workers, called house or nurse bees. These, in turn, deposit nectar in a cell and carry out the tasks necessary to convert the nectar to honey. 
This we have known for about 80 years. And your Lord inspired the bee. Build homes in the mountains and the trees and what the people build for you. Then eat from all kinds of crops and obediently follow the designs of your Lord. Out of their bellies comes a liquid of various colors wherein there is healing for the people. This should be a sign for those who reflect. Remember, this statement was made 1,400 years ago. How in the world could somebody have known 1,400 years ago that honey came from the belly of the bee? This document also claims that there is a healing property in honey. Honey does, in fact, have mild antiseptic properties. The Russians used honey to cover their wounds in World War II. The wounds retained an amount of moisture and left very little scar tissue. Because of its density, no fungus or bacteria could grow in the wound. It is also known that if a person suffering from allergies from a certain plant is given honey produced from that plant, that person builds up certain resistance to the allergy. 1,000 years before the discovery of the circulation of blood, and roughly 13 centuries before it was known what happens in the intestine to ensure that the organs are nourished by the process of digestive absorption, we find a verse in the document. From between the urine and the blood comes pure, delicious milk. Only recently was it found that from what the cow eats, there is a separation of nutrients into the blood and the urine, and the remainder ends up as milk. Progress in botany 1,400 years ago was nowhere advanced enough for it to establish as a rule that plants have both male and female parts. Nevertheless, we read in the document, God is the one who sent water down from the sky and thereby brought forth pairs of plants, each separate from the other. Today we know that fruit comes from plants that have sexual characteristics, even when it comes from unfertilized fruits like bananas. Of all fruits, God placed on the earth two of a pair. This document stated to early man the remarkable premise that mountains move like the clouds. We know this to be true now, since the earth rotates around its axis and around the sun. But to an ancient, what could be more contradictory to the obvious than that mountains move? And yet... When you look at the mountains, you may think that they are standing still, but they are moving in the same manner as the clouds. Such is the creation of God. We know now of continental drift, a folding which forms mountain ranges. The Earth's crust is like a solid shell on which we can live, while the deeper layers are hot and fluid. Have we not made the Earth an expanse and the mountains stakes? The stake-like stability of the mountains is linked to the folding phenomenon in that the folds provide the foundations for the reliefs that form the mountains. From this aspect, they are indeed like tent stakes driven deep into the ground. He makes his chest straightened like one who climbs towards the sky. Fingerprinting became a scientific method of identification in the 1880s with the research of Sir Francis Galton. Galton calculated mathematically that no two persons could have exactly the same fingerprint patterns. We can even reconstruct the tip of his finger. All of these scientific phenomena have been taken from the same book. Other examples contain infinitely more precious data, which directly relate to facts discovered by modern science. But it took modern computers to discover them. It is only now that the numerous verses of this text have finally become comprehensible. Dr. Maurice Bacay, an eminent French scientist, says that it is impossible to explain how a text produced 1,400 years ago could have contained ideas that have only been discovered in modern times. Many other scientific phenomena, the barrier between salt and fresh water, the branch-like progression of combustion, all were mentioned 1,400 years ago. In a notable recent experiment conducted by NOVA, it was found that at the exact moment of death, 
there is a slight weight loss in humans, but not animals. This document states that at the moment of death, God takes the soul away. And now we come to the most incredible significance of these discoveries. Remember we said that modern man needs an ultimate miracle to release himself from the bondage of religious frustration and confusion about his creator. Well, it so happens that this ultimate miracle does exist in this document, the identity of which we are about to reveal. This ultimate miracle exists in the form of a scientifically proven mathematical code that is touchable, examinable, verifiable, and utterly irrefutable. Not only does it prove that the author of this divine document is God Almighty, but it also serves as the first physical evidence for the very existence of God. And it serves as a means for preservation for the document itself, so that the reader knows that every word, indeed every letter, is from God Almighty. This document is the Koran. And the ultimate miracle is the perfect and unchallengeable mathematical code. This mathematical code, this signature of the Creator, has always been here in the Koran for all to see. But only recently was it revealed, and then only with the help of a modern computer, by Dr. Rashad Khalifa, the Imam or Minister of the Mosque of Tucson. Briefly, let me explain. The Koran consists of 114 chapters. 29 of these chapters are prefixed with letters that remained mysterious for 1400 years. Nobody knew what they meant until now. Before we go into details of this, let us look at a simple example that will allow us to realize the magnitude of this miracle. Take a simple sentence like, Jack and Jill went up the hill. There are seven words and 24 letters in this sentence, and this is called the simple mathematical structure of this sentence. Now, let us try and change this mathematical structure, but still try and convey a specific meaning in good English. Let us say we want to convey the same meaning with a sentence containing seven words and 26 letters. We must pad two letters in Jack and Jill went up the hill. In trying to do this, we soon see that the word Jack and the word Jill cannot be changed. The word over cannot be substituted for up because it conveys a separate meaning. Similarly, the word the cannot be replaced by a because a hill refers to any hill. In other words, it becomes pretty difficult to change the mathematical structure of a simple sentence and still have an accurate and acceptable statement in English. Now, how about if we try and group sentences that convey specific meanings into a mathematical pattern not only controlling the count of total letters, but also the count of specific letters within words. Suppose we want to take Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water and change the total number of A's plus the total number of I's to nine instead of eight. There are seven words containing the letters A and I that make perfect English and cannot be changed. So we can only try and change the rest of the words, but this will again convey a different meaning to the sentence. It quickly becomes apparent that changing this structure to fit a pattern is almost impossible for just one sentence. Prepare for the shock. The document, the Koran, contains an exquisitely sophisticated control of letters across chapters, within chapters, in combination of letters between words, in total number of sentences, in total number of words, all interlocking with one another, rendering it impossible to duplicate, even with the most powerful computers. Yet, it remains very simple to understand. For example, 29 chapters, roughly 160,000 letters, are prefixed by mysterious letters. Chapter 50 starts with just Q. Chapter 2 has ALM. Chapter 19 has five letters as a prefix, K-H-Y-A-S. Please note that we have chosen English equivalents of the Arabic letters for simplicity of illustration. It was found that the letter Q occurs in chapter 50 exactly 57 times, or 19 times 3. The A's, L's, and M's in chapter 2 occur a total of 9,899 times, and so on, without a single exception in all the initial chapters with the occurrences in multiples of the number 19. 
At the same time that the A's, L's, and M's are controlled in seven chapters that have ALM as a prefix, the A's and the L's are part of the Arabic word for God, the occurrence of which is also being controlled, as you will soon see. At once we realize that there is a deliberate superhuman design that binds the book's chapters, verses, words, even letters. For if one letter was changed, deleted, or added, the whole system collapses. And the fact that this system was discovered 1400 years after its creation proves that it has been perfectly preserved. The foundation of this mathematical code is the opening statement. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, and this contains exactly 38 alphabets or 19 times 2. In the language of the Quran, Arabic, it contains exactly 19 alphabets and four words. These four words, namely, name, God, most gracious, and most merciful, appear in the whole book 19, 2698, 57, and 114 times, respectively. All these are multiples of 19. The total number of verses are 6,346. The total chapters are 114. Again, multiples of 19. We are beginning to see that this unique code must have been pretty difficult to construct. On it are 19. Indeed, by the moon, by the night as it passes, by the morning as it shines, this is one of the greatest miracles. Greatest miracle indeed. And now we realize that 19 is the Creator's signature on everything He created. For example, you and I have 209 bones in our bodies, 19 times 11. A full-term fetus remains in the mother's womb 266 days, 19 times 14. The sun, the moon, the earth line up in the same position every 19 years, and on and on and on. The viewer may wonder, why 19? Well, using our ancestral system of numerology, the Arabic and Hebrew word for one has a value of 19. And this is what the message of Quran is. One. One God and one brotherhood of nations under God. The Quran was written under God's direction. One thing is clear. No human being could have written such a complicated and perfectly mathematically coded text. Not then, not now, even with the aid of computers. One of the most important functions of the Quran's mathematical code is that it proves and authenticates by physical evidence all the miracles of the previous prophets and messengers. Moses parted the Red Sea. Jesus revived the dead and healed the hopelessly blind and the leprous and so on. Now these miracles are mathematically composed within the Quran and proven by this code to be true, God was the witness. His words are divine. And what he has proven by means of the ultimate miracle is that the Quran is indeed his word, the word of God. Therefore, let us look to it to answer some of our most crucial questions, such as why are there famines, disasters, and diseases? And what is the overall purpose and meaning of life? And what of peace? that elusive dream of the righteous, universal man. Given now that the message of the Quran is one, one God, one brotherhood, think of it. All the power and love in the universe in one supreme being, who has assured us that he not only exists, but communicates without question to those who believe and seek out the truth. His laws and commitment Imagine what can be achieved by following his laws and directions.